here we go. So welcome everybody uh, to this event of the EAG Local Chapter Netherlands. Uh, it's our November talk. Uh, I'm co-hosting the event with uh, uh, Karin de Borst that I welcome. And uh, uh, as you may know, this is the second part uh, of uh, uh, events related to decarbonization and energy transition. Uh, that's why we are uh, co-hosting with the special interest community of EAG on this topic. And uh, the title tonight is uh, about simulating CO2 injection in depleted gas fields uh, uh, with the external invited speaker, uh, Rowan Haddad. So before starting, uh, uh, let me as usual uh, welcome uh, all the EAG community, in particular uh, our friends of the uh, closest uh, local chapters, uh, London, Paris, Oslo, Aberdeen, uh, as well as the uh, Oslo Society of Exploration Geophysicists. Uh, tonight, in particular, the decarbonization and energy transition special interest community, but also the student local chapter of Delft and Aachen. Uh, if you are interested to join our activities uh, and uh, follow our events, uh, you can contact us on our email. Uh, you can also look at our uh, events on our LinkedIn page. And uh, uh, these are some of the local chapters that we are collaborating at the moment. But uh, of course, uh, uh, if you are part of another local chapter and you want to join us, just uh, uh, reach us out as well as if you want uh, to uh, organize with us or co-organize with us uh, some events, uh, you're more than welcome to send us an email. Uh, before starting with the program of tonight, uh, I want to, um, uh, to give you a heads up on uh, uh, the next year event that we are organizing. Uh, there is a question mark because of course uh, uh, we want to we want to have uh, this event live, but uh, we don't know yet if there will be conditions uh, due to the current situation of the pandemic uh, to have this event uh, uh, live. Um, anyhow, we defined uh, uh, a, a date, which is December 2nd. Uh, we defined the time between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. Uh, at the Buccaneer in Delft is the venue. And the talk will be uh, about seismic noise and subsurface characterization for gravity wave detectors uh, by Professor Joe van der Brandt. Uh, of course, if uh, we will not be able uh, to do this event live, uh, we will uh, give you, a, uh, we will send an email uh, uh, one week earlier uh, and we will turn this into a virtual event. So the talk will be there anyhow. Uh, but uh, of course, we are hoping uh, to have uh, a live event uh, with all of you uh, after uh, so long that uh, uh, we cannot do that. Um, today's agenda, uh, again, um, uh, Rowana Dad uh, from EBN uh, will talk about uh, practical ch challenges of uh, simulating CO2 injection in depleted gas fields, a real world project in the Southern North Sea. Uh, there will be a presentation after this introduction of about 30 minutes, uh, followed by a Q&A and discussion uh, led by uh, my co-host uh, Karin de Borst. Um, as usual, uh, if you have questions, uh, please write them in the chat, actually not in the Q&A because uh, uh, it doesn't work uh, even tonight. So I will ask you to write them in the chat and then uh, we will read the question for you uh, during the Q&A. Uh, of course, uh, you are more than welcome to uh, uh, intervene also uh, with the audio, eventually unmute, unmute uh, yourself and, uh, and, uh, and talk directly so that uh, also the discussion will be more lively. And uh, uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce the speaker of tonight. Uh, Rowan Haddad is a reservoir engineer with 10 years of experience in the ENP sector, from integrated green to brown, uh, to brown gas field developments across Europe and Africa. In the last few years, whilst uh, working on brownfield developments in the Netherlands, uh, Rowan has developed an interest uh, in the utilization and of depleted gas fields uh, for CO2 storage. 
working at uh, EBN, Erwan is currently focusing on the development of Portos, connecting the subsurface storage to the transport hub uh, through an integrated approach to minimize risk and ensure the project's commercial success. Rowan holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in petroleum engineering from the Imperial College of London. Uh, please, uh, Rowan, uh, go ahead with your presentation. I will make you presenter. Great. Thank you for the introduction. And Here we go. Uh, thanks also for uh, uh, inviting me over to have this talk. Uh, I will share <clears throat> my screen now. Hopefully you can all see it. Screen one. Share. Presentation mode. Can you see it? Yes, yeah. yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Yeah, so thank you for the warm introduction. Um, yeah, today I'm going to be giving, giving you a flavor of what we have been doing on Portos for the last few years. Uh, 20 minutes is actually quite short to go through everything, so I hope that I've picked the most important aspects of it. Uh, it is really multi-client, but also multi-discipline, so it will not be just purely based on my discipline, but really uh, the entire project uh, and uh, more disciplines in there as well. Um, so we'll start, why are we doing it? Um, I think you all know uh, certainly the situation in Europe, but also in the Netherlands. We have the effect of the Paris Agreement uh, where we uh, derived this ambition to reduce our uh, CO2 emissions by 49% uh, taking the reference point of 1990 by 2030. And if you really look at the, the, the pie chart there on the right hand side, you can see that around uh, the industry part is, contributes around 14.3 megatons reduction and CCUS is roughly about 50% of that uh, industry reduction target. So uh, we really see a great value in uh, CCS and we see Portos as a great, let's say, example because uh, it will be really one of the first and hopefully many as well. What is Portos? So in a nutshell, uh, uh, it's a CCUS uh, project based in the port of Rotterdam and Rotterdam makes an ideal location because it's the uh, industry hub, let's say, and it has about 16% of the national CO2 emissions in the Netherlands, and it has a large industrial cluster. So that makes it a really nice place for us to collect all the CO2 being emitted, uh, transported. So here you see that there's a few emitters, there will be a transport pipeline, and it's also quite close to some of the offshore uh, locations where uh, reservoirs and the platforms are placed. So we can also lay a pipeline and make use of the, some of the existing infrastructure there as well. Um, so that will all be transported onto an offshore pipeline uh, into the platform and then down into a storage location, which is an empty or depleted gas reservoir. Um, if you visualize it on a map, uh, so here is where you have the, the port of Rotterdam. Um, we will collect all the CO2 from the emitters, and this is what we call the clients. Uh, here there will be a compressor station, and then uh, the blue represents the offshore pipeline, and the pink is the onshore pipeline. And there uh, we will collect all the CO2, compress it, and then transport it offshore. This project has, um, yeah, actually it's multiple uh, partners, and that's why the name Portos represents the port of Rotterdam, but also Gasuni and EBN. And that will be all, uh, let's say, joint forces in also operating uh, the, the, the CCUS operations once it comes online. 
And uh, here it will be transported to the P18 fields. These are gas fields that are currently still in production and they are being produced by TACA. So TACA is the license holder for the P18 fields. Um, a little bit on the transport. So I mentioned that uh, we can utilize some of the yeah, existing uh, uh, location facilities. Um, we will have an onshore pipeline, but there is already a, a pipeline corridor. Uh, so it's quite easy to there lay an onshore pipeline and that will be quite uh, big. So that will be quite a 30 kilometer onshore pipeline. Uh, with a 42 inch diameter or so. So it has also quite a big capacity, something like up to 10 megatons per year or so. And I have a small video that I hope will demonstrate uh, uh, the project from uh, start to finish. So here you see that the pipeline is being laid and then all the connectors, all the emitters will be connected to it. Um, and there we will transport to the compressor station that you see here through an offshore pipeline. Then you arrive at the platform and you go down about three kilometers or so and you start injecting into the depleted gas fields. And that's really the main, uh, let's say, uh, configuration. There will be about three to six compressor uh, trains and uh, we will also use the compressor station location as a measure and control system hub also. And for the offshore pipeline, we also have a 16 inch uh, insulated pipe uh, that will go up to uh, 22 kilometers uh, with the CO2 compressed to a high pressure of up to about 130 bar or so. Um, then we arrive at the storage part. So as I mentioned earlier, these fields are operated by TACA. So we are looking at the P18 Alpha platform. Uh, this connects to three depleted gas fields, the P18-2, the P18-4, and the P18-6. The P18-4 already has a CO2 storage license, and that was already uh, quite a few years ago from the Cato, and now we are doing the P18-2 and the P18-6. Um, it's about 20 kilometers off the coast and about three kilometers underground. In total, uh, our storage capacity will be 38 megatons, and that will be based on P18-4 and P18-2. P18-6 is a very small reservoir, which will also be included, but the main commercial capacity will come from P18-2 and P18-4. And if you think of the injection rate, it's about two and a half megatons per year of CO2 that we aim to uh, deliver from the emitters and store. Um, there is always this discussion of, do you want to store in a, a depleted gas fields or an aquifer? And uh, yeah, the debate is uh, almost always there. And uh, the nice thing about gas fields is that you have natural containment um, the gas has been uh, held there. We know the geology, we have a lot of data and we understand a lot more. Uh, so that makes it kind of a nice uh, project to work on and to, yeah, to, to work towards also. In terms of the project itself, uh, where we are at, so uh, we have are in the end of the defined phase. Uh, we have already uh, submitted the permit applications at the end of uh, last year. Um, and we have also submitted uh, for the uh, environmental impact assessment. Feed has been done, but you can see that now we are really reaching, we are working towards FID. And we hope to take that uh, next year, uh, first quarter or so. And then there is a lot more going towards the operation. So we really start to also think about not just the concept, but the well design, uh, the decommissioning, uh, workovers, platform modification, et cetera. So it will really, in the execute phase, we will really start preparing for operations. And we aim to have the first injection by mid 2024. Um, so that's all very exciting. 
Um, a little bit on the storage uh, license and how we have approached that. Um, I think this will be uh, setting the standard for a lot more uh, permit applications to come as more and more fields in the North Sea become depleted and turn into uh, CCUS candidates, let's say. Um, the main thing that we have followed is really a risk based approach. Um, and you can see on the left hand side, we have followed the bow tie analysis. So, I identifying what the top event is. So something like uh, you know fault slippage, and then what is the threat to that, and how do we prevent that? And on the right hand side, what would be our mitigation before uh, the final consequences? Uh, so things like uh, your uh, monitoring plan, your corrective uh, measures, these really all come into play. Um, and that has all been submitted per reservoir and per uh, hazard, let's say. So, um, what are the main risks here? Uh, like I said, we have a lot of data and it's kind of a geologically well known uh, uh, reservoir. But we have identified that, okay, uh, CO2 leaving the storage complex uh, either through the reservoir laterally or uh, through the reservoir vertically. So, uh, think about yeah, your faults or uh, yeah, from your uh, geology, so uh, through uh, uh, cap rock, et cetera, or through the wells, so through the injection wells during injection, but it could also happen that it goes out after flooding and abandonment. So also uh, uh, containment, not just till the end of injection, but also beyond. And then the other one is, of course, seismicity. Um, and that's something that we've had to really pay a lot of attention to. Um, and you can see on the right hand side here, uh, the, these are so from your reservoir, you have a storage complex and that doesn't necessarily go all the way to the uh, sea floor, to the sea bottom. So that uh, includes your primary and your secondary cap rock. Um, and then it also includes the area around your wells. So, anything outside of that is considered uh, leakage. So, also in your design, in all of your modeling, you have to uh, also consider if the CO2 leaves the uh, complex, is it a migration or is it leakage? And migration, it can migrate but remain inside the storage complex or it can leak and go outside the, the, the complex and that is really called then leakage. Um, how do we do this? So, how did we go through the process of identifying all the risks uh, and making a plan to ensure that uh, we can inject safely? Um, as with all projects, and uh, the main thing we have to do is really integrate our modeling. And it's also not very easy here. <clears throat> Because you also have not just the geology, but you also have the flow assurance. Uh, you have your emitter, uh, your your client. So I will come into that for in a bit. But it's really uh, it gives you. We decided to split it into let's say two work streams, and that's your static and dynamic modeling, <coughs> which doesn't necessarily include the geomechanics, but it just tells you about in the reservoir how that uh, how the CO two is going to be injected, how much capacity you're going to get, what is the injection rate that your wells are capable of handling. Um, so more on the yeah, operations and, and, and storage capacity. And then the other side, which is your containment. And that is, okay, given the fact that we did the static and the dynamic uh, modeling, and we know our cumulative volumes, we know our injection rates, what impact does that have on the cap rock integrity, on the fault ceiling, uh, on the geochemical effects, and uh, what are then the potential migration paths? Um, and that then, of course, uh, you need to iterate back to your model, because if you see that through your containment study that something needs to be adjusted, then you need to go back into your static and dynamic and remodel it. So it's really kind of a bit of uh, yeah uh, an iterative um, model here. 
Um, to give you an idea of the structural setting, so this is a, a map with the existing well. So there you have the P18 to reservoir. This is one of the largest reservoirs and it's also the most compartmentalized. And then you also have here P18-4, which is the sliver, and P18-6, which is this second sliver here. And if you uh, take a cross section through them, you see that uh, we are mainly uh, talking about the main uh, Bunter uh, sandstone. And uh, here you see uh, on the top you have quite, actually it's quite faulted, but the faults are also not continuous into the cap rock. Um, and uh, uh, you have quite a thick cap rock. So it's in terms of reservoir selection, it's also quite ideal because you really have this massive cap rock, which is acting as a barrier also uh, and gives you quite a bit of confidence. Um, wells overview. So I have mentioned three reservoirs. We are going to be mainly using uh, the P18-2 and P18-4 fields as the main uh, storage capacity uh, providers. Uh, there we will have three injectors in P18-2 and one injector in P18-4 field. Uh, there will be some wells that will be uh, decommissioned, such as the P18-206, uh, motherboard and the side tracks, those two. And then in the main block is where the injection will be happening in P18-2 and then P18-4 also. And P18-6 is going to be used as potentially uh, either a reserve capacity or for startup since it also has a slightly higher pressure there. Uh, okay, so that's on the wells. I think this is probably one of the most important slides uh, that I will show because that really tells you the entire problem. We all have a goal. We want to have a safe and operable system that we can then transport, inject, and maintain the CO2 from the emitters to the storage reservoir. That's our, yeah, that's the only thing we are trying to do. And somewhere there is an optimum way to do it. And that optimum way depends on the supply. So we also need to know uh, that the store, that the, we have a storage capacity that can match the supply. So we say, okay, we have at least two and a half megatons per year, but we also then have the supply from the emitter. So we need to know how much is going to come into the system. Uh, what is the curve going to be like? What is the composition? Are we going to have uh, a lot of uh, fluctuations, etc.? So those are the questions that come from the supply. From the storage, you want to know what are my reservoir characteristics? What is actually constraining me? Can I meet the supply? Is the injectivity going to be good enough? Am I going to run into trouble when I start injecting? Am I going to start plugging my wells? Have any uh, well integrity issues, geomechanical issues, thermal effects? Um, since the CO2 will also be injected at a low reservoir temperature uh, pressure, uh, your arrival temperature will also be quite low. So we are talking about injecting cold CO2. So what are going to be the thermal effects? And what is really the, the function of each reservoir? So how do we balance the two reservoirs to meet the supply? And then on the other side, so you have your storage and your supply, and on the other side, you have your flow assurance and your pipelines. And usually in a traditional oil and gas project, you have your uh, curve, your, uh, uh, let's say your uh, uh, plateau and you give it to your flow assurance and to your uh, well engineers and your uh, platform. And then you say, okay, design a system that can meet this. And in this case, we are working a bit of the other way around because we, if we have any flow assurance issues, then we also need to take that into account to find that optimum solution. So things like uh, starting up uh, in transient, um, 
what does that give us in terms of the thermodynamics? I mentioned already that the CO2 temperature is quite cold in the reservoir, but also in the pipeline. Uh, so at the wellhead, uh, we keep it above zero degrees, but it will be somewhere from yeah, zero to 15 degrees in the first stage. Uh, so we really need to look at the phase behavior and the operating envelope that we can uh, maintain. Now, all of these come together to really give us that optimum uh, solution. Um, in terms of modeling workflow, uh, traditionally we do the static uh, modeling, so uh, interpreting your seismic, uh, building your reservoir property, grid distribution, etc., and matching it to all your core data. And then you have a loop with your uh, history matching. That gives you a bit of uh, an understanding of what happened over the past 20 years. And I have to mention that these reservoirs are very highly depleted. So the recovery factor is something like between 95 to 98%. So uh, the history match really uh, uh, is valuable because you can really, you have quite a long period with a lot of data that you can understand. And once you have really fully understood that, then you say, okay, now I'm ready to go and model it with CO2. And for that, you uh, need the uh, compositional, but also a thermal model. And that's where we move into a dynamic model. We use CMG, but that's where we move into GEM to really capture the thermal and composition effect. There you can track your cold front, et cetera. Um, and then you say, okay, uh, this is my profile, but what does that mean for geomechanics? So geomechanics add an extra layer to it. So now you don't only look at pressure and temperature, but you also have to monitor your stress uh, in the reservoir, but also in the overburden. So you have to, uh, uh, we use uh, console and gem to make a coupled model and what we do is we basically take a profile from flow assurance, which is based on the emitter supply. We model that in GEM, we couple it with the geomechanics, and we keep iterating until we find that optimum point in the slide that I was talking about before. And that, I think that in itself took about a year and a half, just going round and round and saying, no, okay, uh, this well is uh, maybe too close to a fault. Let's use another uh, well to inject more flow assurance then comes back and says, yeah, okay, but this is not our best well. Uh, and then we keep iterating. And what's important and what we have realized through this is that we don't want a single solution. We want a wide range of operational uh, flexibility. So you really want like a green zone where you can operate in. You don't want to really restrict yourself because the uncertainties are quite large once you start injecting. Uh, this is a bit on the thermal model. So uh, I'll, there's just some uh, animations, but it's just to say that basically you can model it with injecting. So you can see here we're injecting uh, in a reservoir that's about 100 degrees and you inject the CO2 at 15 degrees and you need to watch out for uh, this cold front and where it reaches and if it reaches your faults and what is then the impact on the thermal uh, stresses and the shrinkage around your faults. And that's where we go into the geomechanics. So it's uh, quite a heterogeneous reservoir with quite some high permeability layers at the top and low permeability layers at the bottom. And there you can think of the high perm layers as almost uh, yeah, the highway for the CO2 and also for the cold front. So we have to model things like uh, yeah, thermal fracturing and how that impacts injectivity and temperature also, um, and then fault stability. So once that cold front reaches the fault, what is then the impact? So I mentioned also console fault stability is also quite a critical thing. And it's also quite a, a yeah, you have a, it's, it's a bit of a two way thing because you, at the end of depletion, your fault is most critical um, because of differential compaction. But as you start injecting, your pressure will go up and the fault will stabilize. But at some point you start to introduce cooling and the 
cold will then start to uh, be dominated by temperature. So you end up again uh, introducing the thermal uh, effect there. And there is a balance in between. So we also have to monitor that, uh, make sure that when we inject that uh, uh, we don't induce any uh, uh, fault destabilization in the process. And that's all uh, through coupled modeling. Um, and also through optimized injection. So through the iteration, we think of what is the best way to inject. So as you can see, we have one well, which is quite close to the fault. And we say, okay, uh, then we, because of the proximity to the fault, we can play around also with the injection strategy. So you can uh, potentially use 2A1 as a, a, a swing injector, or you can say, uh, make sure that you do extra monitoring on this well. So you can really uh, play around with your, uh, with your injection strategy. Um, again, this is my last slide and I want to highlight this. So you can see that uh, we have a, uh, uh, yeah, the optimum that we are trying to find between uh, supply storage and flow assurance. We have the emitters that are giving us our supply curve, and we have our, uh, let's say, uh, uh, plateau, uh, if you like. So that's the two and a half megatons per year that we want to build up to after uh, two years. That's our commercial operations. And through that, we have simulated a lot of uh, scenarios from flow assurance, reservoir, geomechanics, and you come up with this kind of envelope where uh, you can see in uh, per rate, what is then, uh, and per reservoir pressure, where can I operate and with how many wells? And you can start to really build that picture and you really can then start to operate more in a safer uh, way so that you are not on the edge. You're not in a place where, uh, you know, here maybe the rate is too low and therefore, uh, yeah, you have constraints from flow assurance. And here you end up maybe uh, fracturing, so you stay away from that. Um, you stay away from the two phase line, etc. So it's uh, kind of yeah, a really iterative approach. And I, for me, it's been really nice to work on it, just because it's uh, really one of a kind. Um, and we hope that it's a two-way thing. We use it as a prototype uh, to you know, as a one of a kind but also one of many. So we also hope to use all the learnings from Portos and apply them. So thank you very much. Um, and I guess I'll hand over back to Yoga or Karen. Yeah, I guess it's over to me. Yeah, perhaps let me also briefly introduce myself. Karen De Borst from Shell. I'm here in my uh, role as chair of the decarbonization um, community at EHEE and uh, really happy to co-host this webinar with Diego and together with the local chapter Netherlands. And yeah, but thank you very much, Rowan, for this uh, overview of Portus and, and, and striking a balance between introducing the project as a whole and also giving a bit of a glimpse of uh, what the technical challenges are and the practical challenges as you already uh, used in your title uh, as one of the uh, ambitions what you would address in this talk. It's a few questions that have come in in the chat box. I would really like to invite everyone to keep the questions coming. Uh, I'm sure there's more that uh, you would like to know. Um, and uh, there will also be the opportunity, I don't know, uh, to um, then um, engage with everyone in an interactive discussion so then also to be unmuted and, and make it a bit more interactive. And from the questions that have come in, let me perhaps start uh, with uh, what uh, Jab Mont asked, uh, and he was interested uh, in compression, uh, kind of and perhaps to generalize these questions a bit. Uh, could you comment on um, the strategy, the, the kind of uh, injection strategy in terms of pressures, in terms of uh, corresponding uh, temperature changes? Because one of the big challenges with depleted fields is always that yeah, you want actually to uh, to transport the CO2 in, in supercritical phase, but then you have very low pressures in the reservoir, so you will at some point have to reduce the pressure, which can induce through Thomson cooling uh, and um, then the phase transition uh, with uh, means that the uh, yeah the part where this happens of your system of, of well and, and reservoir can come to uh, freezing conditions. So what is there the strategy of, of portals, how to deal with that? 
Yeah, so um, uh, for the compressor, I think uh, the when it uh, gets compression up to about 130 bar or so, the temperature will also indeed increase uh, uh, to around 80 uh, degrees Celsius. Um, and as you mentioned, so through the injection, you will uh, uh, have a lot of yeah, Joule Thompson effects, etc. Also in the well bore, uh, we have quite low temperatures. And um, what our uh, approach has been so far is to look per, uh, so we model it in Olga, and we take uh, uh, the arrival pressures and temperatures and the downhole pressures and temperatures, and we check at what point we start to introduce uh, two-phase flow in the well bore because that's really where we want to stay away. Um, mm -hmm. And there we select rates per well that will keep us away from that two-phase line so that we are always operating in gas mode for uh, the, the initial uh, from uh, 20 bar to mm -hmm. 50 bar. And then from 50 bar, we then move over to supercritical injection um, and we have that transition period. So at no point do we have a two-phase uh, flow in the, in, in the well. Um, and that we monitor, yeah, we model through uh, rates per well and yeah, arrival pressures and temperatures downhole. And like mm. I said before, we do keep our ranges very wide. So also for injectivity, uh, quite wide uh, to make sure that we also capture the uncertainty. Yeah. Okay, so it will be kind of um, in the beginning injection in gaseous phase and, and then only when the pressures are sufficiently high in the reservoir switch to supercritical phase. That's, yeah, okay. Yeah. And there's also a question related to that from Cohen Noy. What is the plant CO2 reservoir pressure at end of field life? So what is your starting point in so, CO2 uh, injection? Um, yeah, so that is a good question. So right now the reservoirs are about uh, 20, uh, yeah, 20 bar or so. And the question is, when do you stop producing? Um, so we have modeled down to about uh, 17 bar, and that is our base case. Um, in reality, uh, it's also a commercial decision to stop production because then TACA needs to close down all the wells and uh, Portos needs to then take over. For sure, that will happen during the, co uh, the commissioning for the pipelines and the platform. Um, but we are looking at really a range of 17 to 20 bar. And when exactly that red button is going to be pressed, that is still an ongoing uh, yeah, a decision to be made, let's say. And mm -hmm. at the end of the uh, field life, as an end of CO2 injection, we do not aim to go, uh, because initially these, reservoir, these reservoirs were at about 370 bar, um, so let's say that is your uh, methane uh, uh, containment uh, limit. Uh, what we aim to do is at the end, we have a limit up to hydrostatic pressure. So we don't want to go above hydrostatic pressure. And for the 37 uh, megatons, which is our total capacity, uh, we are a little bit below that. So we plan to go to around 300 and something bar. Okay. No, thanks. And if anybody would like to follow up, like this question was from Cohen Noy, any follow up questions, then, then please um, indicate it. I think you can't raise your hand in Webex or, or Diego. So you would have to make a note in the web box, but then you, uh, the chat box. You actually, you can raise your hand, but uh, I'm also unmuting by default. So if the person that is uh, asking wants yeah, to interact, is free to do that. Okay, thanks. We got another question from Jaap uh, on monitoring. I wanted actually to drive the discussion anyway a bit in this direction. And the question is to what extent is seismic monitoring applied? Uh, 2D permanent multi component array, for example? Yeah, so that's a bit of a tough one um, because we are uh, uh, really looking at, uh, for example, we also looked at uh, micro seismic. Uh, in there, there is quite a few, uh, uh, yeah, through the KMNI uh, network, but there is not really uh, something that you can uh, use whilst also injecting in the wells. So, um, a lot of, yeah, uh, for the seismic monitoring, it will really be using the network and also through the inject injection, uh, bottom hole pressure, bottom hole temperature, etc. 
but in terms of yeah, really direct uh, to the uh, uh, mon seismic monitoring, it's not the plan to have that. And mm -hmm. there is also uh, not a lot of yeah testing done with it. Let's say. Um, so yeah, it will be uh, mainly through uh, monitoring downhole pressure and temperature, and through the KMNI network. And, and perhaps following up to that, you also mentioned that you want to, um, to keep uh, injection rates per well rather flexible uh, and also use monitoring data to optimize injection and, for example, also preventing a cold front from reaching a fault and so on. And, and which monitoring data would you base that on? Is this then also, as you say, downward pressure and temperature or is it kind of pressure as a proxy or yeah, and also, just propagate uh... or? Yeah, but also uh, things like in the first two years, we have our technical operations phase and that's really, we see that as an opportunity to also design lots of uh, tests. So, for example, interference tests where you can monitor the pressure uh, uh, from one well by shutting it off and then injecting in another and making a network where you can really try to, uh, yeah, uh, predict what the plume behavior is like in the reservoir and at what point you uh, see it through the other well. So uh, things like that. And also monitoring, yeah, indeed, things like with the injectivity, then calibrating your model to that um, and seeing. So not a direct measurement, but let's say through modeling and collecting that data. So basically, injectivity increases as an indication of fracture, and and then from that, trying to estimate fracture size. And, For example, and, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, good. Um, since no questions are yet coming in through the chat, again, yeah, would like to encourage everyone uh, to um, yeah ask uh, whatever you would like to know to Ron. Um, but um, just one is coming in from Yap again. Um, is it possible that the CO2 is contaminated to cause problems uh, or is the CO2 cleaned? I think that's a yeah, so very I good think question. <laughs> it's again uh, one of the um, yeah, one of the, the points where we say, okay, we design our system to handle uh, uh, this CO2 composition. So on the composition, there will be some limits. So for example, uh, there will be a limit on oxygen. Uh, things that can cause corrosion uh, in the system, those kind of things will be uh, set so that the emitters have uh, yeah, have a, a criteria and we also have a purity. So it will be minimum 95% and uh, up to pure, completely pure CO2. But there will be always also uh, the composition will always be monitored from the meters at the emitters, but also before entering into uh, the offshore uh, at the compressor station also. So there will also be uh, yeah continuous monitoring of the CO2 stream. Okay. If, um, if I may ask a yeah, question. Yeah, please, yeah. please. Because you have many clients or a number of clients, and some clients might produce clean CO2 and the others sort of dirty CO2, and you say maybe, well, if you mix them up, you end up with the CO2 which is has a low contamination. Is that the way you're going to do it? Now, so we have uh, basically a, a meter at the end at the every emitter side. So oh. each emitter can report what they are putting in the system and the purity. And you also have one at the compressor station that you can also see there once it arrives there. So if you see that the purity is starting to go down or you measure some contaminants, then you can, uh, through the control room, go back to the emitters and there needs to be a way to communicate between them. So you then need to go back to each emitter and say, okay, who is uh, putting in the system something that's contaminated and then potentially uh, identify the problem and decide if you want to shut, the, shut that uh, specific emitter off uh, or yeah, if your system can handle it, continue. So it will be really a monitoring process and you might even need to do a sample there as well. Okay, thanks. If I may, I have another question, but maybe somebody else. Perhaps, like yeah, we, we've now got some in through the chat and, and one is coming back to the monitoring. So kind of again asking, so there will be no 4D style monitoring with seismic at all. 
No, no plans to do for the uh, uh, monitoring. And I think there was a, a study done on the benefits. Yeah, let's say the benefits of having the 4D uh, seismic monitoring. And I remember that that was, uh, uh, let's say, not very beneficial in this case. And you couldn't really see that much, especially not in the uh, with that phase of the CO2. So not at, let's say, uh, the supercritical boundary. But I could also dig that out and uh, come back with an answer, a proper answer to that, because that was from my colleague. Uh, I can come back on that, but there are no plans. Uh, for yes, this is this is Jack Lavelle from Shell. I'm I'm in geophysical operations, so obviously I have some bias towards uh, active uh, geophysical campaigns. But I understand cost is a major driver here, and you need yeah. to know whether or not you're going to get a 4D response. Uh, I just wondered how you you went through that journey with the government because uh, you know it's it's quite tempting if you're a, if you're the regulator to ask for all this uh, you know, uh, you know at least a three D baseline and then a repeat in a couple of years to see if something's moved. So how did you how did you convince them? <laughs> um, that is a good question. I think the main thing here is that it's really. Um, also, for the uh, storage for the permit application. It's really one of the first, and there is also no set criteria. So we also work together in a way because we want to have an optimum. So they also have advisors from TNO, from uh, uh, Norway, etc. So I think there it's also quite a, yeah, in a way a bit interactive as well. So we also involve them in saying, okay, here is what the benefit would be, but there is not the guaranteed benefit. Um, and that we can then also uh, minimize the risk at the beginning through controlled injection. Um, and I think that that kind of makes it a bit easier also with the regulator. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, the, 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 the short answer is just by having a lot of uh, discussions and open discussions on why we don't think it will add value and why we think what we're doing is safe enough that we don't need it. And you mentioned that you would be detecting with micro seismic from the KME network. So I also worked in in Kroninger looking at the earthquakes there, and there we had to densify the stations quite a bit to detect the micro seismic events, uh, even the ones that were, uh, shall we say, causing uh, public concern. I'm I'm wondering where your nearest stations are and how how actual actually how sensitive they would be to a micro seismic event. Um, I'm not sure how, about the network and how far they are, but I know that the minimum detection is about a magnitude of two and a half. Oh, that's pretty big. And that's also what the models were calibrated on. So, uh, yeah, we say there has been no seismicity in the history of the field, but actually there has been no detected seismicity where the threshold is about two and a half. So you could never detect a magnitude half or magnitude one the, as, as things started to creep. Uh, yeah, so you could have yeah lower ones that have not been detected, but yeah, you can detect from two and a half. Okay. Okay. Got it. It's actually also a question from, from Kevin Wisdom, uh, and, and he has also added, has there been any forward modeling done to have an idea of which magnitude range of seismicity you would expect? I mean, on the one hand, based on, on full slip, and on the other hand, possibly also for nivellable fracturing and, and cooling uh, effects on falls or uh, in the reservoir yeah. for fracturing. Yeah, so I mentioned that we uh, did the console model, and actually that was done through a contractor. Um, and what you see there again is that uh, they uh, calibrate the model so that at the end of depletion you have a critical a fault criticality at two and a half, which is the detectable level, and then you do a forward modeling through uh, GEM, which is where we also model our CO2 injection profile, and there you see uh, through yeah, cooling through the pressure uh, what is the magnitude that you arrive at. And what we see is that the faults actually start to stabilize. And as you start to cool down your reservoir, the, the thermal effects start to take over, but you are never, uh, you never reach that two and a half that you started with. So that you are always ending up more stable than actually when you started because you removed the differential compaction. 
So that has been done, but of course there is a lot of uh, input parameters where you also have to, uh, yeah, for example, the minimum stress, uh, it's a depleted field and we cannot do a mini frac there. So there is quite uh, an uncertainty on what your minimum stress is. There is quite uh, an uncertainty on your stress recovery, et cetera. So all of these have been modeled uh, in the yeah in the geomechanics and we try to keep it very conservative and that also goes back to the question of how do you communicate or how do you present it to the regulator one of the things or one of the approaches we have followed is we have said we give you the more than the worst scenario so this is really if everything was to go wrong if we inject at maximum rate if the minimum stress turns out to be too low if if, 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 so all the doom scenarios put together and then we are still okay because we still don't uh, predict uh, seismicity with more than the magnitude that we started with uh, the two and a half. So still below the detectable level. And that has been our approach so that we say this is a very, very, very worst scenario, which we don't even plan to go there. But even in that case, we are still okay. And perhaps a brief question still to that, and, and Kevin, feel, please feel free to also speak up if you want to add anything or, or follow up with another question. It was more on the modeling part. So could you briefly comment on, on how you modeled fault slip, the considerative models that you have be, uh, been using, and, and also the influence on temperature on fault stability? Yeah, sure. So we uh, basically give the, uh, for the thermal fracturing, everything is done in GEM. So uh, that's a simple uh, barton bandis model that you uh, have. And uh, you basically have your pressure temperature from GEM, but you also then have your stress. You initialize it at the depleted field. So you initialize it at your initial uh, stress. And then you model with injection what your uh, induced thermal stress will be. And that gives you a change in your injectivity around your well. So that gives you, let's say, the, the effect of thermal fracturing. And then we stop there with GEM. We then take this uh, pressure temperature profile and we put it into console. And in console, we then also build an overburden model and a fault model uh, with a mesh. And there you also start to uh, yeah, do the modeling to see then what is the criticality on the fault. So it's basically linked between GEM and console. Right, and, and Kevin here. So if I may ask a follow-up question on that. So what in console or how in console do you define fault slip? Is that Coulomb stress or what's the criteria that defines fault slip? Yeah, it is, uh, uh, it is indeed uh, through uh, Coulomb stress, and you define it through uh, yeah your critical uh, factor. So from your uh, uh, and if that's bigger than a threshold of say a 0.7 or something, then you say that your fault is critically stressed. I have another question related to I'm... seismic monitoring. Uh, the the magnitude itself is interesting, but of course you would like to know exactly or as closely as possible the location where the micro seismicity happens and of course i think you are using stations on land so at yeah. a distance and not sort of around it so you cannot probably determine that very well no and that's also one of the yeah that's also one of the problems so the only thing that you can do is again uh with modeling with modeling and then collecting data from the field uh, go back and try to calibrate your models and see there if you can match that. But it's always going to be difficult to pinpoint where is that coming from. And I think there will be also some fields in the surrounding areas as well. So, yeah, it's uh, going to be quite difficult. And I think for now, we think that we may be able to derive it through yeah, calibration of the model potentially. Okay, and so, another question I have is uh, if I Perhaps um, we have still a question sitting there in the chat for quite a while, so apologies for interrupting. It's, it's something now going a bit away from the technical part uh, to uh, the economics and the commercial model. 
and perhaps let's take that one first and perhaps come back to the seismic monitoring uh, or a follow-up question from you, Jack, if you still have time. Uh, it's from Ewald van Dedem. Can you say something on the cost to business model? And an uh, interesting one, what happens when the reservoir capacity is reached? Uh, where, where will the emitters then put the CO2? Yeah, indeed. So that's quite a, an interesting question. Um, for the commercial part, I'm probably uh, not the right person to answer it, but I, I think uh, there is uh, a commercial side to it, of course. Um, the business model is that you more or less book capacity um, and there is a contract between uh, the emitters and Tortos where you uh, uh, say how, how much the supply is going to be and uh, yeah, the charge will be per uh, uh, per whatever you supply or the rate. And then uh, if there is a shut in, et cetera, then there will be some sub uh, uh, points in the contract for penalties, et cetera. Um, and I think in terms of really, if you think of it the profit, let's say, I think the margin of profit in CCUS in general is never going to match that of oil and gas, um, and I'm not sure we have the right metrics to really measure that, to be honest, but I think we are kind of heading in a direction where most companies want to do CCUS, but need to find the right metric to measure your profit and your business model. And that's still ongoing, not just within EVM, but I think within most of the yeah, oil and gas companies also. And then when the full capacity has been reached, hopefully, there will be more projects. So there will be more, uh, for example, uh, Aramis, uh, Porto Space 2. Um, yeah, look, a lot more storages available that you can then. I mean, I said the other day, I think we were talking about this, and that we really envisage a plug and play thing from Apple where you have a network for the pipeline in the Netherlands, and then you can just plug and unplug storages. And that you just have a network where you have a constant supply and that you can just really switch around with the reservoirs and which reservoir shouldn't matter. So you should be able to handle, uh, yeah, to hook up any reservoir and have the pipeline to deal with it. I think that will be the vision or the dream in the Netherlands. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the long term goal, I would say. I think that sounds like a perfect closing statement, a vision for CCS in the future and a positive one on it. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I would like to hand back to you, Diego, but I don't know whether we would like to keep um, the, the meeting open for more uh, questions. I don't know about uh, your time. Yeah, I think, I think uh, we, we still have three minutes. So if anybody wants to ask us okay. something more, we can wait until 6 p.m. and uh, and then we close. Then, yeah, check. So um, I think you still wanted to add something on the monitoring. Uh, Yap probably wanted to say something. Oh, what did Yap? Uh, I thought well, it was Jack. I think the thing I want to say is that, and and of course, I think you know the TNO and so on are all very well aware of that. You really should make this a showcase and open all the communication possible so that people really realize how well it can be done because you want to extend it to more fields, but then the public is very conscious about what could happen. And so, if you make this really showcase, then I think there is a future for more of those sort of field injections. That's all I want to say. Okay. Indeed, we cannot get it wrong. <laughs> no, you can't get it. Uh, you don't get a second chance. No. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Me too. Any other question from the audience? I don't see questions coming anymore. So maybe I will just uh, renew and again thank uh, Ruan for uh, her participation, for answering the question, for the interesting talk, and uh, all the people attending from uh, EAG, the interest community in the carbonization energy transition, as well the other local chapters, uh, and uh, ev everybody else. Um, and I will stop recording now. Uh, if you want to stay a little bit more, feel free to, to stay after this. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.